I've recently made videos about teams that have won numerous Scottish Cups in the past. Renton, Vale of Leven, St Bernard's, all of these amazingly successful football teams that were based, yeah, in and around Scotland's central belt that were, yeah, hugely successful and massive back in like the early days of football in this country. But what if I told you there was a club who have won 10 Scottish Cups and even came runners up in the English FA Cup as well. This hugely successful team here in Scotland now currently play in the fourth tier of football. And it's quite a shame that they're not as well known the world over as what maybe their trophy cabinet suggests they should be. Look up Pioneer in the dictionary and there'll be a picture of Queen's Park Football Club. A huge thank you to everyone who has downloaded one football so far. I'm currently in Queen's Park Recreational Park, which is where Queen's Park started, but we're gonna get into all of their history and stuff and yeah just for context for anyone who has downloaded don't skip this part of the video because it is I'm gonna be looking at Queen's Park and what they're at just now and what they're like just now what league they're in so as you can see they're top of league two so the set uh, the fourth tier of Scottish football here they're above teams like Elgin, Stranra and all that kind of stuff Stenhouse, Muir team that I've seen a lot, Albion Rovers yeah all these grounds that I've been to Queen's Park are currently top of yeah league two I thought I'd demonstrate that with today's sponsor and if you are looking for a football lap then do go down to the first link in the description box below and download it if you haven't downloaded it already um, off one of my videos then please do so using that link below it will take through to the app store one football alerts come from this video and it's just a really good football app and uh, yeah you won't regret getting it it's, it will just keep you up to date with all the football needs completely free as well so yeah completely free great football app supports my channel and uh, yeah you can keep up to date with teams like this but yes Queen's Park are in League 2 the fourth tier of Scottish football so yeah, I'm currently on Queen's Park Recreational Grounds. There is another Queen's Park part where it's just literally a nice big park, but this, yeah, is the Rec Grounds, which I guess is used for sport the majority of the time, and it's where Queen's Park started, but we're gonna get into all that. Um, I'm gonna try and fit the whole history of Queen's Park into one video, the oldest club in Scotland. So yes, if, um, as ever, I do miss anything out, do let me know in the comments below. It is hard to fit everything into one vlog, but I will give it my best shot. The minute of a meeting which went ahead in 1867 went like this. Tonight at half past eight o'clock, a number of gentlemen met at number three Edgelington Terrace for the purpose of forming a football club. This was the first properly, properly, I've said that twice in two videos now. This is the first properly organized football team in all of Scotland. That is so long ago, it's over 150 years ago. The amount of teams that have come and gone in that time, yet Queen's Park is still around, about 153 years or something later. Before Queen's Park formed as a club, there had been football played in Scotland. Scotland, but it was quite disorganized and um, yeah like they weren't proper clubs it was more public schools the rules weren't consistent between all the teams that played each other and it was just a bit of an unorganized mess and as I've said in a few of my videos before it was a bit more like a mixture between rugby and football it was more described as what I've seen online as kick and rush or yeah just a load of dribbling or more to the point hacking as well however Queen's Park came along in the mid 1800s and they're very much considered the first team to bring what is now modern day football to Scotland. They laid the foundations for the football that we see here today. They adopted the passing game, which focused on skill and ball control. Fair play to them, I bet the pictures were pretty grim. And yeah, before you start thinking, oh, it was Pep Guardiola and Barcelona and all these kind of teams in Spain that did tick attacker first, no. It was Queen's Park, all right? The club decided the players should not be paid. And they had this Latin motto of Ludere Corsa Ludendi, or for, to play for the sake of playing. And that motto is even on their badge to this day. However, I'm sure this has held them back over the years as over their over 150 year history, not one single player has received a dime from the club, nor have the club been able to receive transfer fees for players who always leave on a free. So any big talent goes for free. Look at Andrew Robertson was there for a while, but I think this has changed or is all due to change anyway, um, as obviously the modern game has progressed and there's so much money in the game these days. But yeah, a little bit more on that Later. we'll focus on it early history for now and we'll get to that but yeah players would usually get travel and training costs like paid for them but in terms of actually getting played paid to play for the club was a big no-no their amateur roots really make Queen's Park a truly you know unique club you must say in the world of football and uh, yes I'm gonna take my hood down for a bit 
it's so grim today but yeah we're about to head off to Hampden Park where I'll tell you a little bit more about Queen's Park as a club and there it is, Scotland Stadium, National Football Stadium rather, coming into view. And I always find it amazing how a League Two team play their football here, or yeah, have done for so long. That could all change, or will all change pretty soon. Um, but yeah, more on that later on. Let's keep on with the uh, early days of Queen's Park, this truly old club. Queen's Park were at the centre of forming the SFA, Scottish Football Association. Before these types of organisations were made the world over, football matches were unorganised, sporadic, and most of the time didn't even resemble much football and were more, yeah, like I say, rugby. Regional cup competitions and stuff were played before the SFA, but it was just a little bit of a mishmash. However, in and around that time, Queen's Park also played a big part in establishing international football as well. How could a club side do that? Well, let me tell you. On the 30th of November, 1872, a friendly was arranged between an English side and a Scottish side. The Scottish team, and it was actually, before I get into the teams, it was played at Hamilton Crescent. And I'll leave a link in the description box below to a few videos. Uh, one is from Hamilton Crescent in Partick, which explains a little bit about that first ever international match. So yeah, look, here we are now in the shadows of Hampden. But yes, the first ever international game was sort of organized by Queen's Park and the SFA between a Scottish team and an English team. Yeah, at Hamilton Crescent. Again, links below. Oh, it's so grim out today. Do remember to hit that like button and subscribe if you're new. But yeah, in 1872, a match between England and Scotland took place and the Scottish team were completely made up of just the Queen's Park squad. Not only that, but they played in the Queen's Park kit as well, which was dark blue at the time before they switched to black and white hoops, which they wear now. And uh, yeah, they, um, the Scotland national team even wear that color to this day. In that same year that the Queen's Park team literally played an international match. I'm just gonna stand under the cover for this little section of the video anyway. In that um, same year that the Queen's Park team played basically an international match, they were invited to come and play in the English FA Cup for the first time. And that really set the ball rolling for the Scottish Cup up here, as well as other organized football competitions. And um, yeah, the international game that I was just speaking of was nil-nil. Queen's Park's first ever FA Cup game was nil-nil against Wanderers as well. It does make you wonder how football took off so popularly that the first two games were nil-nil. But there you go, that's just the game that we all love, isn't it? Whilst we're on the subject of FA Cups, as I mentioned earlier, Queen's Park did reach two FA Cup finals in 1884 and 1885. They lost both times to Blackburn Rovers. Blackburn, a bit of a bogey team of Queen's Park. Once things reopen again, can uh, Queen's Park and Blackburn organize a friendly or something to raise funds for COVID and we can give them like a little fake FA Cup to lift to whoever wins? I think that'd be fun. A year after that first international game and Queen's Park playing in the FA Cup, it was 1873, the Scottish Cup was born. Queen's Park would go on to win 10 of the early Scottish Cup editions that there were. And it was around this time that they moved into Hampden Park number one. We will be coming on to the stadiums later. And again, I have covered the Hampden one, two, and three, the trilogy of Hamdens that there are. This is Hampden Park number three, would you believe? And uh, yeah, there was two iterations of it beforehand, which I've made a full video on. So again, I will link that one down below too. But yeah, it was 1873 that a Scottish Cup was formed and Queen's Park moved into Hampden number one. But before that, they had played in Queen's Park Recreation Ground, which is where we started the video. And yeah, it was around this time in the early days of Scottish football that Queen's Park obviously won their first Scottish Cup and the football world has a lot to thank Queen's Park for. It was around this time that it was yeah kind of coming to the fore the sport was and it was Queen's Park who came up with the crossbar with half time and with free kicks so there you go, Queen's Park invented all three of them, the crossbar halftime and free kicks. The entire football world, if you don't know about Queen's Park and you've watched a game of football and you love the beautiful game, then the next time the ball crashes off the bar, you can have Queen's Park to thank for that. So yeah, here we are at Scotland's National Stadium and as you can see on those grey silver pillars there, it does say Queen's Park Football Club. So yes, small League Two team nowadays play at this huge behemoth. But there's a reason that, yeah, they play here and they're so well connected with Scottish football as a whole. But let me, uh, wouldn't mind finding somewhere dry for me to tell you my next points as we move into the 1900s. If you look at the record 
of Scottish Cups won by club. Queen's Park a third on the list. Celtic and Rangers obviously dominate with 40 and 33 respectively. But look third, and it's not Aberdeen, it's not Dundee United, it's not Hibs Hearts or any of the other big teams that you recognise today. But it's League Two team Queen's Park that um, hold the record for the third most amount of Scottish Cup wins, the most prestigious cup competition here in the country. Despite being third on that list, every single one of their 10 cup wins came in the 1800s. And in 1890, the Scottish Football League was formed and being an amateur team and being so big and influential, Queen's Park hugely opposed this notion because they could see professionalism starting to creep into the game, which kind of went against their ethos and their motto. And eventually, even though they opposed the league, that they did start to get eclipsed by the bigger teams as, you know, there was weekly football being played from Celtic and Rangers and even like all the Vale of Leavens and teams like that, Third Lanark and stuff. But um, yeah, it took Queen's Park 10 years to finally decide to join the Scottish Football League. It was hard for them to organise fixtures with all the other teams in the areas obviously having to fulfil their league fixtures. Who were Queen's Park going to play? I think they would have still competed in cup competitions and stuff like that, but yeah, they didn't want to compete in the actual league system. How mad is that? And it took until 1900, 10 years after the foundation of the league to actually go into it. And that same year that they joined the league, they did get to the cup final where they lost 4-3 to Celtic and that was their last cup final appearance even to this date so yeah like 120 121 years ago because Queen's Park were amateurs still and everyone else was professional the league granted them special dispensation and even if they finished bottom they would not get relegated so yeah they had a special thing that said they wouldn't get relegated if uh, if they finished in those positions they never really took to league football and their best ever finish was seventh and that was in the 1917-18 season they, were, they really came alive when it was uh, cup time. In the 1920s, they lost their special dispensation not to get relegated. And uh, yeah, in 1922, they finished second bottom and went down. They went on to win that division that they were in at the first time of asking, winning, I think, 24 out of their 38 games, meaning that they got promoted straight back to uh, the top division once again. During World War II, the league structure of the country was uh, reformed. And uh, yeah, as clubs couldn't warrant playing far-flung fixtures because fuel had to be used for the war effort, leagues were broken up into more regional divisions. So during the reconstruction, Queen's Park entered the Southern Scottish League. Although these games and leagues were unofficial and aren't really counted to this day in like teams' trophy cabinets and stuff, it, um, it gave a reprieve to the people of the nation who uh, yeah, wanted a bit of a release on weekends, I guess, when not having to think of the constant like battles and awful stuff that was happening during the war. But how could the teams have kept going if the majority of their players were at war like they were? It was actually youngsters, 16, 17 year olds who weren't old enough to go to war that played during that time. And so, yeah, in these unofficial tournaments, it was these young players that were starting to emerge who played for the clubs at that time. I know it's hard now to see games being played behind closed doors and we all want to get back to football and normal life, but just think about the sacrifices of these other men, you know, almost 100 years ago now during World War II, obviously World War I about 100 years ago, World War 80 or so years ago or whatever, they all had to go off to war. It was just the young players who played in regional little leagues for people to go and watch. Just think of their sacrifice and the sacrifice of the people and our little sacrifice that we really have to do today really pales in comparison. And after the war, national leagues came to be again and uh, Queen's Park were put in the top division, not due to their league form, like maybe they should have been, but due to the fact that they played here at Hamden at such an impressive stadium. During their post-war period over the next like decade or two, they did okay. They had a few ups and downs, relegations, promotions, but as is the case, because they're an amateur side and their players could basically be snapped up for nothing and they weren't paying their players as soon as they had a good run and they had a good squad assembled other teams came in and poached players of course are you going to play for a team where you're not getting paid compared to just nipping across to Rangers or Celtic where you can still be a star of a football team but get a wage for it and their motto to play for the sake of playing was obviously starting to hinder them in this post-war period and um, yeah that Latin motto that is still not on their badge to this day was obviously starting to hold them back as money was becoming more prevalent in the game. Now, I hope you can see up there. If not, I'll include a picture that I've taken before on another day, but there is a man up there 
who, uh, who has played for Queen's Park, who you may know about. During the 57 season, a very well-known man, even to this day, made his debut for Queen's Park. A young 16-year-old forward made his debut versus Stran Ra. He scored Queen's Park's only goal in a 2-1 defeat. This forward would go on to score 170 goals in over 300 games for teams like Dunfermline, Rangers and Falkirk, just to name a few. As a manager, he would go on to win two Champions Leagues, 13 Premier Leagues, a European Cup Winners Cup, three Scottish Premierships and way way more. If you haven't guessed already, it's Sir Alex Ferguson. He started his senior football career here at Queen's Park. It was around Fergie's playing time that Queen's Park last played in the top tier of Scottish football. It was around the 50s or early 60s, I think, that they were last in the top tier of football. Since then, they have only ever competed in tiers two, three, and four. So moving into a bit more of the modern era now, in 1994 slash 1995, the league structure in Scotland was reformed. It was that year that it was reformed into being four divisions of ten teams and Queen's Park then found themselves starting their new life in that new tiered system in the bottom tier. It wouldn't be about five or six years after that until it became 12 teams in the Prem, by the way. A few changes and tweaks were made to the whole pros thing in the 90s. Queen's Park had now sign players that had previously been pros. They had completely stopped themselves from doing that before, but now they could sign players who had been pros just as so long as they hadn't paid them themselves whilst they were playing here. They also allowed themselves to loan pro players, again, just so long as they themselves weren't paying those players. As the 1990s turned into 2000, Queen's Park enjoyed a little bit of success, winning the fourth tier, becoming champions, and Hampden Park was also renovated into the modern beasts that we see today. But yeah, despite them sticking to their model of not paying any players for so long, those tweaks were made in the 90s, but I'm pretty sure that now they are semi-pro, or at least they're becoming semi-pro or have done in the last year or so. I have found an article, but yeah, I guess, um, which I'll read in a sec, but yeah, I guess they've just found it hard to compete with smaller teams. I mean, Queen's Park used to be massive, and had they been able to pay their players and operate like, a, like the rest of the football teams over the years when it came to money, then could they be a bigger team than what they are now? Think about it, if you were a player, would you rather play for Queen's Park with the heritage they've got with this stadium, they've won 10 Scottish Cups, pioneers in international football, but not get paid. Would you rather pay for this, play for these guys and not get paid? Or would you rather play for, I don't know, a team like Albion Rovers in the same division who, you know, still a decent team. They've had Jock Steens played there and stuff. They've been in a Scottish Cup final themselves, but haven't quite got the history and heritage stadium of Queen's Park, but you're going to get paid by them. What would you prefer? I guess a lot of players, especially in the modern day, would rather go and get paid to play somewhere than play for the badge on the shirt. And that motto, I think, has really kind of held them back. But I do respect them for staying true to what the club's ethos is. Yeah, would they have kept more players, more of their good players over the years? I'm sure they would have done. Even Andy Robertson played here, like I mentioned earlier. Would they have been able to keep him for a little bit longer if, uh, if they'd have been able to pay him? But yeah, anyway, Queen's Park fans, let me know what you think about it, if there's any of you watching. But I found this article, so... It was on BBC, 12, uh, 14th of January 2020, so just over a year ago now, Queen's Park begin transition to professionalism with part-time contracts. Queen's Park have begun their transition to a professional club by offering their entire first-team squad part-time contracts. The Glasgow side voted to end their 152-year status as an amateur club in November, the last senior Scottish side to turn professional. Prior to the move, players were only financially compensated for travel and training uh, uh, and matches, there you go. Um, now each player, including January signings, have been offered a wage, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, basically, Queen's Park have recently transitioned to become a professional club, or at least semi-professional anyway. So yeah, will that help them going forward? I'm sure it will. But where does that leave them in terms of their motto and like what the club stands for and stuff? Now, I can't go this whole video without even really touching on their stadiums at all. and. Look at that. I've, like I said, I have made a complete video and it does warrant a whole video, the whole three Hamdens thing. But this is the site at which Hamden number one used to be. You can see there the fantastic mural of uh, Scotland 5, England 1. Just over there to the left through those trees, that is where we started the video. Queen's Park Recreational Ground. That is where they played their first ever games and where they get their name. This is Hamden number one. And yeah, it used to be a huge football stadium here, of course, until this railway line was put in, which cut through 
the pitch and stuff which now just leaves the bowls club but yes there used to be a stadium here but due to the railway line that cuts through it they had to move to Hamden number two just across the road from Hamden number one this is where Hamden number two was and you're thinking a lot of you who know anyway will be thinking that's Kafkin Park not Hamden Park well this actually used to be Hamden Park before uh, Queen's Park wanted to go and move somewhere a little bit more modern that they could renovate and do up which is now where Hamden 3 is which is just over that road over there which is where I've been today obviously this is uh, this is where they were before that and um, when they left here though they couldn't just leave the stadium and like you know let it rot which is obviously what's happened now but yeah third Lanark moved in another Glasgow based team but yeah third Lanark are another legendary old club but they're obviously disbanded now themselves and uh, they even won the league title and they played here but now their stadium lays abandoned but yeah after Queen's Park left here third Lanark moved in Queen's Park then moved to Hamden and um, Hamden was the biggest stadium in the world until the Maracanã was built in the 1950s. But yeah, Queen's Park moved in there in the early 1900s, biggest stadium in the world till Maracanã was built. And uh, yeah, Queen's Park always had a strong link to the SFA and the Scottish national team, hence why so many cup finals and international games get played at what is their home ground. In 2020, the uh, behemoth that is Hamden Park now was transferred from Queen's Park to the SFA for just five million pounds. From what I've heard from people that I've met and stuff, it wasn't the fairest of transitions. You can't find anything about this online, so do let me know below what you think about the move. I think they were kind of held over a barrel, if that's even a phrase, Queen's Park. Do let me know if that's true. I don't want to speak out of turn or say something that's wrong, but that's what somebody told me anyway. Um, Obviously, I can't find a lot of the information out about the deal online, but yes, it is now SFA owned, or will be anyway, with, yeah, Queen's Park obviously having to move to Lesser Hamden. And yeah, so they'll eventually move here to Lesser Hamden, which is Hamden 3.5. You can see there, Lesser Hamden, the badge, which even says there, look, Ludera Corsa Ludeni, which is uh, to play for the sake of playing on their badge. And I'll just show you their kit quickly. Look at that, the, the hoops, and then oh, I actually really like that kit. Yes, yeah, so eventually they are going to move from Hamden over there to here which is lesser Hamden but yeah look as we come round to this gate here you can see it's under construction the pitch is through there look at all this mud and stuff it's still got to be constructed ready for use ready for league football and stuff but yeah this is where they're going to be eventually but imagine look it's in the shadow of their former historic home imagine that you had to move out of your mansion and live in a bungalow next door but who knows maybe it'll suit the club and it's more fit for the fan base of the club because usually from the research i've done games in here can uh have about 500 people at them in a 50,000 seat stadium which is about one percent of the entire capacity of Hampden Park so yeah maybe them playing here isn't such a bad thing for the club after all and yeah big changes are afoot for Scotland's oldest team and stuff. They're now starting to pay their players. There is Lesser Hamden, which you can see into next to Big Hamden there. And uh, yeah, the club is starting to transition into the more modern times. Football fans in Scotland and all around the world may now look down on Queen's Park as some small little obscure team playing in League Two. But you can't knock them for staying true to their word all these years to play for the sake of playing. Where would they be if they had ditched that motto years ago? I don't know. Without Queen's Park, I probably wouldn't have the channel I have and I wouldn't have made the amount of videos that I have about all the different clubs here in Scotland. Queen's Park laid the blueprint for what we now see in Scottish football. Without Queen's Park, we wouldn't even have crossbars half-time or free kicks for goodness sake. That means you wouldn't be able to grab a killy pie at half-time and then watch Lee Griffiths score his free kicks against England. So next time you watch your team curl in a free kick, do think of Queen's Park. This is a club that has won 10 Scottish Cups and has been at the forefront of football for decades. So yeah, if you ever look at Queen's Park as a small little football club, then just remember what they've given the world of football over the years. Please do remember to hit that like button and subscribe if you aren't already. I really would appreciate it as we're so close to 16K subs now. Do also go down to the first link in the description box below and download One Football. I'll leave some videos around my head as ever so you can keep watching my content. Thank you so much for watching. I'm gonna go home and get dry. I'll see you in the next one.